Hey there, fellow classic comic collectors. As always, I'm Scott Harris King, and today I've got another episode of the Classic Comics Forum podcast to share with you. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I am uh, recently have just started recording, video recording all of our podcast messages. So I'm posting the newer ones first because I have video for those. At some point, I am going to post uh, the first 26 episodes of the podcast or whatever it was that we were doing that was audio only. But I do want to add some visuals to those to make them at least a little bit interesting to look at. And I just say it's very time consuming. Um, let me know in the comments below if you just want me to upload the audio. I know a lot of podcasts do that. I, I can do that um, if you're dying to get to them. Or I'll also have the link below to listen to the podcast. But anyway, today we're kicking off a new three-part series. I'm joined by special guest Tartan Phantom to discuss the seminal 1980s Mike Grell independent comic series, John Sable Freelance. This is one of the first really big indie books in the wave of uh, creator-owned titles that came out in the very early 80s. Grell was one of the big names that defected from Marvel and DC and started publishing his own comics at the time. And so it ran for 56 issues, and in this episode we're going to be talking about Mike Grell as a creator, the origins of, of John Sable. We'll get into issues one through six. We're also going to kick off at the beginning where I'm going to have a little interview with Tarn Phantom about his collecting history. Um, so I'll have some timestamps below if you feel like just jumping right to the discussion of the comics. This is the first part of a three-part series. Every two weeks I'll have another part of this. So I'm really excited to show this to you. And uh, let's just jump right into it. John Sable Freelance, part one. Uh, we'll just start with uh, what's the first comic you ever read? First one I ever read or the first one I, I tell you what, the first one I ever remember buying and I still have, and I have a copy to this day. Now I don't have my original copy and I'll tell you why. Uh, Fantastic Four number 50. Uh, and I was every bit of three and a half years old when that came out. But see, the thing is I started reading my mom was a elementary school teacher and I started reading at a very early age. Um, I was reading at first grade level around age four. And uh, it's because she read to me from birth. And so I started learning were, you know, learning things by memorization and then started learning to recognize word, words and letters, you know, learn my alphabet very early on. And I can't say that I read, you know, but man, the pictures sure were cool in that one. Uh, and that's the first, that's the first Galactus saga, you know, um, and, and the, uh, <laughs> the funny thing about that book is that my mom, uh, and she let me buy it. I mean, bought it for me, you know, uh, the, I wanted comic books, you know, I saw them and, and I had friends that had some and, you know, and, and so when you saw them at the drugstore, you know, I wanted some, I bought that one, uh, based on the cover, which has, uh, it's a silver surfer cover. And um, <clears throat> so took it home, read it, you know, or read it, so to speak, you know. But uh, the thing that I remember the most, the way that impacted me the most was the fact that my mother looked through it and read it. And she decided that um, the uh, silver surfer as a Christ figure was not exactly what she wanted me to read. <laughs> okay. So out the door it went. <laughs> but because uh, I was raised in a Southern Baptist household. So yeah, yeah, she was not too thrilled about that. After that, you know, uh, it, it, she she wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, go through books that I bought. I was real big into Batman, of course, it was 66. And, uh, and I didn't miss the TV show uh, as a three-year-old. And um, so I was, you know, I loved Batman. I liked Superman, but not as much as I did Batman, you know. Right. So that's that's my earliest comic memory is that Silver Surfer, that Fantastic Four number 50. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a religious household. I went to church school, private church school yeah, yeah, for right. my entire life. And um, there was a lot of pressure not to read comics. My grandfather was like, Everything that's fiction is bunk. That's what oh, he, treasure chest. 
Well, we wouldn't. <laughs> now, see, I grew up a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, okay. So okay. the Catholic Church was a big no-no. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So they would never have allowed me to read Treasure Chest. <laughs> um, uh, Fantastic Four Fifty. So I'll just really quickly tell you my story on this. Um, I don't currently have a copy, but in 1989. We went to a convention in Boston that Stan Lee was going to be at. And I was so excited. I was like, I was so excited. And my dad drove me in and I got some friends to come with me. And they really weren't that excited. And it turned out, you know, we got there like 10 o'clock. Stan Lee didn't show up till like 2 o'clock. And they wanted to leave. They were done. And so I was like trying to get them stay. And I'm like, you know, I'll buy you some some comics to get Stanley's signature. So I bought a friend of mine, like a Thor 385 or something. But there was this guy that had this table right across from where Stan Lee was. And he had a, a warehouse find, but everything had been damaged. So he had all these stacks and stacks of these Silver Age comics, but they all had like water damage right. or damage on them. And there was a whole pile of Fantastic Four 50s, like this big. And uh, my friend Rob and I each bought a copy and it was, wasn't too bad. And I had all the scraping on the spine though. So it's probably like a four, maybe yeah. 3.5, but we each bought it. It was like 10 bucks and we each got Stan Lee to sign it on the surfboard right on the front cover, like a big signature. And then <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't have it anymore. I don't remember what I did with mine. I think he still has his, but I don't have that anymore. Wow. That, that book has impacted people in ways we wouldn't imagine, I guess. <laughs> uh, so other than John Sable, what's the most recent comic that you've read? Um, most recently, to be honest, I've been going through the back issues of Vault of Horror. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the gemstone reprints. And I've just, uh, I'm about um, on issue, matter of fact, I think I finished issue 10 last night. And uh, it's the first time I've pulled those out and read them in quite a quite quite a while. Uh, but I tell you what, the thing about that the uh, the uh, Johnny Craig covers just kill me. Yeah, yeah I, the the art in those is amazing. I don't do well with horror stuff. I don't like horror, and yeah. it's a little too visceral. The EC stuff. I remember when I was oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I first got into comics. I was at. I kept hearing about how great EC was. This is in the eighties. So I couldn't just read it online. So I bought for like 20 bucks. I bought, I forget what it was, but it was, Oh, oh EC horror comic. And, uh, I got rid of it as fast as I could. <laughs> it was, it was you, I was just like, Oh, you, you have to put it in the context of the time in which it was published. And think about if you're a 10, 10, 12 year old boy growing up in the early 1950s, this is probably about the coolest thing you've ever seen, but right. yes, it's very, I mean, I can, I can definitely see uh, why uh, uh, not only Worthen, but uh, Estes Kefauver had a problem with those books. <laughs> yeah. They're um, the famous quote, you know, do you think this was in good taste? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah I'm not sure. <laughs> a lot of that stuff was in very good taste. No, it's not. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what's your favorite, uh, comic book character? Favorite character? Well, I guess in terms of superheroes, <clears throat> I would say probably the Spectre, uh, DC Spectre. And I don't, don't ask me why I've gravitated towards that character. Um, but I, I, I it's, I can't really explain it, you know, uh, I, and the, my first exposure to the Spectre uh, was in those early uh, uh, showcase you know, when they revived the character for the Silver Age. Um, and then in the early 70s when they did the first Secret Origins run and had one issue in there that was reprinted, the original Murphy Anderson, I mean the original, um, uh, sorry, not Murphy Anderson. Um, <sighs> trying to think of the guy's name. I can't, I can't remember his name either. Uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, I, keep, I want to say Marty Nodell, but that's no, not no, right. No, 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 no. It's, uh, uh, well, anyway. I can't remember it either. <laughs> but it reprinted, it reprinted the, the, you know, which that story ran over two issues because it was only, you know, like a six, eight page story uh, in more fun comics. 
and so it ran over two issues. It's Bailey, right, Bernard yeah, Bailey? Bill, um, uh, uh, um, not Bill Bailey. He got to come home. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard Bailey. Yeah, okay. That's it, Bernard Bailey. Um, and and I just thought I just thought it was uh, one of the coolest. I mean, you know, the character could literally do just about anything he wanted, and I'm like. At that, you know, at, at a young age, you don't realize, well, that really proposes a problem for the writer to come up with interesting stories. Yeah. You have a, a nearly invincible and omnipotent character. What do you do with it? I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can only, you know, you can only uh, beat up gangsters so often before it just, it, it plays out. Um, so I would say the Spectre is probably my top uh, superhero character uh, genre wise. Um, as far as, uh, uh, um, war characters, I'd have to say enemy ace. Okay. I, I really like what Kubert did with enemy ace. Uh, yeah. So. I, I, ha I don't have all of them. I have some of them and it's a great character. My favorite war character is unknown soldier. Um, but I do like enemy ace quite a bit too. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you didn't say, uh, uh, haunted tank. Uh, those are so formulaic. I mean, it's it's really kind of a running joke. You know? Yeah. <laughs> every, you could take, you could read, you know, haunted tank stories in any sequence you want. They're all going to end pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I I liked haunted tank when I was a kid. Again, this is yeah. in the eighties. But um, when I started really collect, collecting war comics ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, well, I guess longer ago than that. When I really started getting into it, I got rid of them pretty fast because yeah. they just don't do it for me. I, I'm a big fan of the Losers, um, yeah. and I'm a big fan of, of Unknown Soldier. I like Sergeant Fury as well for different reasons. Yeah, I like uh, I like Sergeant Fury, and I liked uh, uh, the uh, uh, Sergeant Rock, and you know, and Easy Company was okay. But it just really didn't it didn't grab me as much as as Fury and, and the Howling Commandos did. Yeah. And, and and I really uh and I guess it's probably because uh I, it probably has to do with the fact that I like the <clears throat> original Nick Fury run in Strange Tales and 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 the solo series so much. And yeah. so I really like that character uh in the in the international uh espionage and covert operations and so in the, in the war stories i can still relate to the character you know a uh, 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 fury and dub dum 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 dug is not too bad either so yeah so uh who's your uh or what's your least favorite character least man, wow you put me on the spot um least favorite character i would have to say in general um and a lot of people are not going to like this, but I would have to say probably the uh, Claremont and after X-Men. I just, I've never cared. The Claremont to me was like, uh, and I think I even made a comment in a, in a post recently uh, on the forum that um, I might as well have been watching Days of Our Lives because that's pretty much what it was like. And it, it, it I don't mind talking heads in a book, believe me. The, the series we're going to cover, John Sable, I don't mind talking heads at all. There's a lot of it in there, but it's got it. It it it's you got to reach certain points in a storyline, uh, you know, to, to and make salient points in a storyline for it to hold the interest of the you know the reader. And when you're right. just dragging things on and on and on and on, and and the relationships are like Beverly Hills nine hundred two one zero, it just it doesn't do anything for me, you know. Yeah, I've uh, Claremont is someone to me that uh, you know, someone who started reading in the '80s when the X Men were the biggest thing in yeah. comics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. They actually never really grabbed that me that much. My friends in school loved X Men. They're sort of the, I guess, the stereotypical like. They just loved Wolverine. They loved the X Men. They all got into the X Men so much, and I read it but not regularly. I dropped the book several times and I've realized I eventually went back and at one point had almost a whole run of the new X-Men. I was only missing a couple issues and having read them all, I kind of realized that uh, my first issue was 196 and I'm like, all the good stuff 
came before I even started reading it. Yeah. Uh, and it's my favorite thing Chris Claremont has done is uh, the John Kowalski stories in War as Hell. Um, so I guess I'm not. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty good. No, those are actually pretty good. Uh, you know, I mean, I just I can't quite put my finger on it. I think it may have been me rebelling against the popularity of them at the time in the 80s that I just because I've got I mean, I've got a few X-Men issues, but I, I can probably put them in a stack about that deep, you know. Uh, you know. I don't have that many. Um, and so, you know, when I go hunting for books and everything, usually the last two to three boxes in the row of long boxes at the shop, I don't even touch them. Like, well, I, I skip to the Z's, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I do the same thing. I skip to the Y's to get yeah. to young love and young romance. Yeah. And I don't bother looking at any of the X's at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that just, uh, and, and, and I, in that I say to each his own, if you like them, more power to you. If, if it's what you enjoy reading, have at it, you know? Um, so what creator do you think is underrated? underrated um well that's that's that man i think probably for me and this ties back into the specter and also into jonah hex uh i think uh michael fleischer is probably because i mean you have people that appreciate his work but he's never been known as a high level, you know, name like, oh, I'm collecting all stuff Fleischer did. You don't see that, you know, but uh, I, I think he was a very effective writer, a very creative writer. And um, I think I think more people, if they would take a chance on his work. And again, a lot of it's concentrated in just a few few titles, you know, for the for the bulk of his work. Um, but I'll tell you right now, when that. I was, uh, you know, in the fourth grade when that when Adventure kicked off that Spectre series that he wrote, and it blew me away. Um, you know, and then and of course, uh, you know, when he started, then when he started writing in Jonah Hex later on, like, oh, yeah, I really like this guy's writing. Yeah, I, I'm a love Jonah Hex, um, and Fleischer also did. Uh, unless I'm mistaken a run on warlord while i was reading yeah. that i love warlord and uh, i i agree i think he's great he's really underrated um it's too bad that he ended up leaving comics uh because he he turned into great stuff jonah hex is one of my you know favorite titles same here and we could have done done this on, you know done this on jonah hex too and maybe sometime in the distant future we'll do that but uh that's uh probably i'd, I'd put that title particularly particularly the the weird western and in the first the first title series uh i'll put those together bundle them together and put them in my top 10 books you know titles of all time yeah well okay so the next question is what what creator is overrated we already talked a little about chris claremont uh, so if you want to go back to claremont that's fine but if you have someone else it's fine. no i uh, um i mean claremont if you're expecting Claremont and you know you get Claremont that's fine uh overrated and I don't really I can't really touch a whole lot on modern modern era uh you know uh creators because I just really don't buy modern era books unless it's something I pick up in a dollar bin and find interesting um but as far as say I don't know uh, that's I, I really hate to put a I really hate to put a poor label on anybody because I think everybody's got their niche, uh, but I, somebody that I really, if I see uh, you know the, the titles on a book I'm like okay big deal, and and a lot of people are not gonna like me for this but I would say uh, a lot of and a lot of Frank Miller's later work, uh, I just I think he was just uh, kind of going through the motions. Um, so, you know, in that case, now, now don't get me wrong, Miller had some spectacular moments and I, you know, but I think he rode on the, on the fame of his name or the notoriety of his name after Daredevil and after uh, uh, Dark Knight 
And after that, it was like, yeah, he really wasn't, you know, he was phoning him in. I'm not a big fan of Miller's work, so um, I'm totally fine with this answer. When you were <laughs> when you were trying to come up with an answer, I was like, my default is if the guest doesn't have doesn't have an answer or doesn't want to say anything, then I say John Byrne and we just move on. So, but I'm fine with Frank Miller too because I appreciate on some level some of the stuff he's done, yeah. but I also feel like to me. And I haven't read all of his work, but I've read quite a bit of it. The best work that I've read of his is Batman Year One and the uh, Daredevil, uh, what's it called? Uh, Born Again. Yeah. Both of those are drawn by David Mazzuchelli. And um, I think that for me, like, I don't think a lot of his other work actually holds up that well like if you read dark knight returns now i'm not sure how well that really works these days uh so i agree with you (laughs) (laughs) um so if you were stranded on a desert island uh and you could bring one comic with you now by comic i mean one you could have a whole title or one storyline or whatever you want individual issue what comic would you bring? What would be your thing, your comfort, you know, thing to read on the island? Will Eisner's The Spirit, the 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 the, the uh, Saturday, I mean, the Sunday inserts. I've got that whole collection, and far and away, a, a Spectre may be my favorite character as far as superheroes go, uh, but uh, there's something about the Spirit that I, I can't put my finger on, but I absolutely love those Eisner stories. And I think that guy uh, was so far ahead of his time in terms of not only scripting and storytelling, but panel design, layout, and using elements in the book, in the layout, to guide and you know areas of focus for the reader. And it, I can read them over and over and over again, and I have. And it just, I, it's never, it's, uh, that is, I don't call it a guilty pleasure. That is far and away, probably my favorite title run of anything. I have to admit, I haven't read them yet. Uh, I was like, it's like with a big like hole in the middle of my reading, but so I can't really comment, but I, other than to say, I, I know I have to read them. I just haven't done it. <laughs> uh, I wish yeah, I had some insightful. I, I highly recommend the, uh, the hard cover. Of course, they're all out of print. And um, the, I got a, I got a really good, uh, my wife bought me the entire set for Christmas one year. And uh, it, it has been a, just a source of endless reading pleasure for me. All right, one last question before we get to John Sable, and that is, what would your dream comic be? So if you could have any title, any character, any creative team, living or dead, you get to put everything together for your dream comic. What would you want? Um, I would say uh, well, you know this uh, this um, uh, grill writing on sable is it, it pretty much knocked me in the creek the first time I read it. but uh, gosh, that is really tough. I would have to say it would it would have to involve uh, uh, Eisner. As as a, as probably the writing force, um, and the editing, and doing the editing, um, and how about uh, how about uh, uh, the the Mesa of Lost Women with uh, J. Scott Pike doing the artwork <laughs> <laughs> and Eisner scripting it? <laughs> okay, I'd read it. I'd buy that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that wasn't the that wasn't what I was expecting you to say. <laughs> but uh okay. Now it's interesting that you this is a great segue into into John Sable because you mentioned Grell and his writing, you know, knocking you out here the first time you read it. And I agree, I had the same experience the first time I read the series. I loved it. Now I just finished rereading the whole thing for this. And I have to say, I came away with uh, a little bit more mixed feelings the second time around. 
around and is several many years removed. So we'll get into that here. But I think just to set the stage, I'll talk a little bit about um, how the series came about, and then you can jump in if you have anything sure. to add. Uh, so I read some interviews with Grell where he was basically he threw himself into the creator own stuff as soon as it really started really started taking off in the early 80s with uh pacific first and then um then first second uh but there was this big wave of the pacific and eclipse and first these these, uh comic book companies that were providing creators uh, an opportunity to own their own books and get their books out into the direct market let me see if i can fix this video thing here you're getting some you're getting uh you have a uh it's my heavenly girl behind you uh, yeah yeah um (laughs) and uh so there's a lot of creators there's almost like a mass exodus of these creators people who were not to get too far off topic but they were basically pulling a jack kirby you know when kirby was gonna leave marvel and go to dc for a couple years he saved up all of his good ideas because he didn't want them to go to marvel and then he used them all as soon as he got to dc we start to see that in the early 80s where we have all these creators who want to own their own, keep their rights, and you stop seeing a lot of new cool characters appearing in Marvel and DC because instead the, the creators bring their good ideas to their own books. Mm-hmm. Now, in the interviews I was reading, Grell was saying that basically he was just so tired of doing superhero books that he wanted to get away from all that. Now, he became yeah. famous first on Legion of Superheroes, but also on uh, Green Arrow and Green Lantern. Um, and then he had Warlord, which wasn't a superhero book. But to hear Grell tell it, he was kind of burnt out on all that stuff. And so he started doing his own creator own books. First, he was doing Star Slayer at Pacific, and then that, that moved over to first when Pacific right. went under. And Star Slayer is basically Warlord, but reversed. So right. instead of a, a modern person in a fantasy setting, it was a old-fashioned fantasy person in a futuristic setting yeah but kind of the same character um but basically he very quickly stopped working on star slayer and brought in a new creative team to take over that book and he put all of his attention on john sable he wasn't doing any other work it's interesting that you mentioned chris claremont because grell said he was so tired of doing the superhero books that at some point around the time this came out, which is 82, right out, which is right after when John, basically when John Byrne left X-Men, Chris Claremont mm-hmm. flew to Mike Grell's house to try and convince him to draw X-Men, and which would have been huge money. Yeah. Um, and Grell said no, because he just could, didn't want to do any superhero stuff mm-hmm. anymore. It's interesting to think what that would have been given the artist's input in the Marvel process if Mike Grell had been co-creating X-Men at the time. Uh, But instead we get John Sable here. And the first thing that jumps out to me when I read Grell's work, John Sable in particular, is if you look at the major series that he is the creator of, Warlord starting in the late mid late seventies and then John Sable. And then as we'll talk about at the end, green arrow there's a continuum there because to me he's writing this same character uh three different versions of a very similar character and all of those characters are mike grell himself Mm -hmm. and uh it really jumps out to me when i started reading this and we'll get into the first issue and the first arc here in a second that um the similarities uh, between those characters, but particularly since we're talking about the beginning here, between Warlord, Travis Morgan, and and uh, John Sable. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it, on that, or any of that. Well, the, um, I think I think out of the three, I think Sable character wise stands out a bit because uh, you know the 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 guy uh, effectively you read the entire series and for reasons which are explained in the book and we'll get to you know it's the guy's basically got a death wish okay um and 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 understandably so given given the context of of the storyline but um 
I guess between him and and Warlord, uh, I see some parallels there, but I, I view Warlord as more of a almost almost dystopian scenario, you know, um, because you know you you got a, a jet fighter and all, you know, like you said, it's the present going into a fantasy world, which. You, not necessarily equates to the past because you know we're talking about you know underground center of the earth or whatever you know i mean uh but it's a it's a different it's a different model of society that he is transported to essentially and and and, and sable now there is a there's a connection there because the, for sable there's a different model of society from what uh, uh his time in africa is versus what he is now right you know so there, there there's a there's a similarity there um but yeah i think in a lot of grell's work he projects himself into the work so I, and the thing is you know you see a lot of that now in in modern comics a lot a whole lot more than i like which is one reason why i really don't read them uh, because usually it's done a lot of times unfortunately is done with a, with an agenda in mind oftentimes I don't know that Grell so much had an agenda as he was using it maybe, maybe in, when writing these titles as a cathartic process for him to work through things in his life. Right. Um, and, and one thing that I know there, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, Grell is a well-known firearms enthusiast and it really comes through in this book, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, really comes in. Sometimes it's almost heavy handed. Oh yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> we'll get into this uh, in a minute. But Grell, um, he's not always subtle. Uh, he's not often subtle, <laughs> I should say. Um, and I don't mind that. Yeah, uh, well, take Longbow Hunters as an example. There, yeah, it's yeah. not always really subtle. <laughs> so. Um, Let's jump right into the first issue. So okay. he does something really interesting here at the beginning, where he he waits to give the origin story. So here's uh, here's my copy of the yeah. first issue here. I've got it signed okay. out here by Mike Grell. Oh wow! And um, he basically brings us into the story where he he doesn't give us the origin. He introduces the character. And he does it by having like this sort of single case. Um, it's like uh, he wants to do like a one and done, but he packs every page of this comic with so much world building setup that it's um, it's kind of like a tour de force because we get. I've got my notes here. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Yep. So we get. Um, we see like his lair and he has like, he does like a thing where he's like practicing. He has this danger room almost in his basement where he right. practices. We get that. We get like his, uh, we get a little bit of his backstory where he's like this well-known like uh, mercenary because he had this famous case that was on all the news. So he's sort of like a local celebrity. And that comes up a lot in the series where everybody kind of knows who he is. Um, but then we get, immediately we get his alter ego um and it's it's interesting here where it's sort of a, a, a reverse of your typical thing right where um uh it's it's kind of like superman where where uh sable is the real character and then the alter ego is actually the the just this costume that he puts on is bb right. e. phlegm <laughs> this uh guy who who writes children's books and we also get um introduced to eden his uh literary agent who he clearly has uh, like a physical relationship with we uh get set up that he's about to go meet his new artist on his series mike but um, Mike doesn't actually appear in this first issue, but it's set up that we're going to meet Mike. And um, we get a thing here where the bad guy is someone from his past that has a grudge against who is a former mercenary partner of his. And 
they've got like this uh history and um it's it's a lot uh yeah. and he has the room to do it because it's 28 pages and it's all growl all art all writing and uh the extra space really gives him room to fit all this stuff in and i think for a first issue it accomplishes a lot it's very packed with stuff but it's it's really solid um I, and i think it's a really good idea not to start with an extended arc but to just to give you this one issue story so you can see everything that the character is right off the top well you know the, the it does cover a lot of ground and i think one of the things that's really interesting about issue number one is that if you'll see you know and i think this was really done uh, i hate the glare there sorry uh it was really done uh with capturing a portion of the market in mind the whole concept of the battle mask and used on the on the front cover and and throughout the the, the first uh issue uh, i think that was to draw in your uh your your traditionally superhero readers because it does make it does the front cover makes it look more like a costume of sorts you know than just his uh, regular working clothes which is right. really what it is you know um and 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 you know with so i think that was used to really like i said draw in new readers because we were talking about a totally new character okay who is this sable character hey it looks like uh she he's some kind of uh, he could he looks kind of like the tarantula you know uh uh, <laughs> uh from dc but uh you just don't know um and 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 i really like the fact that uh you've got a a a a a dump of information but it's done in such a way that it makes you okay i've seen what this character can do now let's i gotta get extra issues and find out what what why is he like this what's going on you know i, I thought it was a really good effective way to do it because he does drop enough hints throughout the story that it's it sucks you into the point where like this is, i gotta see what happens in the next issue you know uh, and the fact that he, uh, I really like the fact that he used uh, his publishing agent, uh, you know, uh, is a, is a female in this case, you know, so the, the, the book is certainly in the, the further you get into the book, even though it deals with a lot of uh, 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 what would be uh, traditionally male topics, the, the females in the book uh, all have are, are very very strong characters they're not they're not superficial you know um as far as the central characters go you know right and and i thought that was a, a another way of uh drawing in what um what a few female readers might put, pick the book up you know right and, and of course you know we we know that uh, traditionally you know this has largely been a, a male hobby uh and so if you're going to pick up female readers you 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 need every opportunity you can to attract a female reader to what would possibly be otherwise a pure male storyline right another thing that's interesting here to me is so the, the plot is that he's hired by president reagan to yeah. prevent an assassination and yeah. there's a couple of things here so this, this is coming out of 82 there was of course a an assassination attempt on the president in of president reagan in 1981 so yeah. he's drawing from the headlines this is something we're going to see throughout the series yes. not yeah. just the political content but specifically tying things to current then current political things i, I was just in a doing a, a an online convention a couple of weeks ago where i was a, a panelist and uh um, there was a the, uh, uh, panel I went to where I actually I wasn't a panelist on that one, but it was talking about 1986 in comics, and someone was someone asked what comics from 1986 don't hold up anymore, and someone said that John Sable doesn't hold up at all anymore, and I was like, I don't really think that's true, yeah, but I do think that. I don't think I've ever read a comic book that was as specifically tied to the time period as John yeah. Sable. It's not just from the 80s, 
it's set in the 80s and it's about the 80s. Right. A lot of the storylines are specifically about things that are happening at the time in the 80s. And I wonder, I do wonder how well the series would read to someone who doesn't have the context of the 80s, you know? Yeah, and I think that's really, a, a, it's, it's almost a throwback to the uh, early golden age where, you know, World War II was very topical. And so your books, you know, from 1940, not 41 or 42, but from 1940 up through 45 were a lot of them, you know, were, were focused. I mean, a lot of them were, were, were done in a propagandist manner, you know, you know, uh, buy those war bonds and war stamps and things like that. But, and that's fine. But uh, uh, the, the subject matters of the story were, uh, you know, tied directly to the headlines of the times. And you really, you didn't, you know, you saw that occasionally in the 60s. I mean, uh, and, you know, especially with Denny O'Neill in the late 60s and early 70s, you saw a lot of the stuff he was doing uh, where he would tie to current events of the time. Um, and, and, but I think even, even so, you can read this as either a time capsule, which almost every comic is to, some, you know, to a large degree. But I think that the, even if the, the uh, topical nature of the subject matter, uh, it, you know, if the subject matter is, is topical to and tied to a specific time frame, the concept, whether that's uh, good versus evil, right versus wrong, or the gray area in between either, uh, that's still relevant. If you can maintain that relevancy, it, it, it never loses its, you know, its, its power for entertainment. Yeah. Uh, there are certain references that we'll talk about when we get to them that are a little bit dated, um, but, uh, and there's certain ways he handles certain topics that feel very mm -hmm. dated, but again, very of the time period, but getting ahead of myself here. Um, so we got issue two. Uh, here's issue two. Death is a bum deal. Yeah. Um, again, he's wearing the mask and stuff. The mask really kind of disappears um, yeah. after a while, uh, and it, it's really not important. Um, it's he phases it out quietly. You'll still see it later on once in a while, but it, it's it's just not a thing. Um, I think the mask. I think the battle mask made its biggest splash in the later pages. Because, you know, people are like, you really don't need it, you know. I mean, you read some of the letters in, in these books, and they're like, why do you have this? You really don't need it. And I think he took that to heart. The letter column is interesting you bring it up, because the letter column uh, is very interesting. The 80s, for me, is kind of a golden age of letter columns. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it gets pretty contentious. There's a lot of people that write in to tell them how bad the comic is and how they're doing this wrong or that wrong. Uh, and then the editor gets angry and yells at the <laughs> people writing. And um, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's an entertaining read to, to read through those and you, you get a lot of interesting stuff. Um, but you know, the thing about that, Scott, is the fact that they published those letters. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a, uh, a you know, like with a lot of other books and, and other publishers where they would take largely glowing letters and may throw in a, a, a complaint letter every now and then. This Sable is filled with complaint letters throughout. And yeah. they don't pull any punches, you know? Yeah. Um, so issue two, I'll just go into it real quick. Uh, there's For me, there's not a whole lot to talk about here, but... The basic plot is that there's a, there's a secret group of Nazis that are planning to have a new Reich take over, and uh, I felt like this is definitely setting up some future issues because there's a whole dangling thing. I uh, don't think that ever re it didn't really ever get picked up into the degree that I thought it was going to. I thought this was going to be the setup for like a big yeah. ongoing mystery, and it really wasn't. Um, The plot hinges on the new UPC, the barcode technology being right. brought into grocery stores, which, um, you know, at this point, it had been several years since the technology was introduced, but it was not widespread. And so it's really 
this is, again is something that's very much of the time. Um, everyone now is just, you know, you scan the things. But yeah, there was a time when uh, like the grocery store in the story doesn't have a scanner and it becomes a major plot point because there's secret messages hidden in the barcodes. Uh, and um, I just, it made me laugh. <laughs> Well, let's say so, uh, it would, it would uh, you know, if that were, if, if barcodes had just been introduced now, uh, your most popular conspiracy theorists would have a heyday with them. Yeah, I'm sure they would. <laughs> um, the most important thing that happens uh, in this um, is that we get introduced to Mike. So uh, he's, he's assuming that Mike is a dude, but it turns out, no, it's Mike with a Y. And it's this woman who's taller than he is, something that they bring up a few times. It's like a recurring thing between the two of them, mm -hmm. how short he is, because she's actually quite tall. And um, it's clear that she's going to be a major character and it's sort of going to be a love interest. And in some ways, uh, we'll be talking a lot about the relationship with Mike because it's the centerpiece of the entire series is there yeah. is their arc, which begins here in issue two. And um, I don't want to get into it too much because we're going to talk about it a whole lot, but Grell has very specific concepts of how you should write relationships mm -hmm. um, in, in stories and in comics in particular. And, uh, I feel like he did something with this. I'll, I'll just get into it now, I guess. Grell has a thing where he, he thinks that the, the will they, won't they is important to these relationships. And if you, if you resolve that, people lose interest. And so what okay. he does, you see it a lot in Green Arrow, is there's always something that comes up that splits people apart or whatever. And in this story, he does something a little bit different where it's a very long running, long simmering, thing and they eventually get together and it's very satisfying yeah uh and then as we'll see or i'll discuss in detail when we get to it once they get together uh that to me is the natural ending to the series yeah and then he just has a bunch of stories that don't feel like they mean anything after that. and um it's just interesting because I've seen, I've read so many interviews, different interviews where he talks about this thing. He always talks about like in Moonlighting, when they finally got together, the show stunk. And he right. was determined not to do that. Uh, but he actually does do it in here. And so it's very satisfying for a reader to, to experience this arc with a natural conclusion. And then it's less satisfying to continue to read the story because not because I think fundamentally he's wrong. I think you can still do things, but I don't think he necessarily knows how to keep it interesting once they're together. And, right. and then it sort of loses the thread for me once they get to that point, because I feel like he just doesn't have anything else to say at that point. Well, and, and that, um, you know, when you, uh, I would say after around issue 45, it, I would put it a little bit earlier, but well, we, yeah, right around yeah, there. Yeah, it, you, 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 know, you realize that that, that uh, I mean, the relationships there to stay, and so how do you build? How do you build? If that's been your your virtual cliffhanger for three or three and a half years, you know, then how? Do, where do you go from there once you drop that? Yeah, and, and it's it's challenge. That would be a challenge for any writer, really. Uh, so. I mean, I could see that. I think one of the most interesting aspects aspects of the character of, of Mike Blackman, who's the new artist who you know we're talking about, is the uh, fact that throughout uh, there are still, and like you said earlier in issue one, it's, it's it's fairly obvious he's got some kind of relationship with his publishing agent uh, that's slightly more than platonic. We don't know how much of that because we're only you know now we're only two issues in. But uh, uh, but that that triangle, and it's not really a competitive triangle from the point of the women so much as is a decision triangle from the point of John Sable. You know, uh, he's not really sure what he what you know. You've got that those, and I guess it's really more of a of a of a uh, a, 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 a four a four way because um, there's still there's still the specter of his his wife in the picture too 
you know, and, and we get to that later, but a matter of fact, very shortly, we'll get to that. <laughs> but um, I, I think, I think the way he plays the dynamics there are, are, are interesting because you don't know what you're not really sure, you know, is this really going to happen or is this, it, 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 you know, this early on, you just don't know. One thing I do like about, about Blackman is that uh, from, from, from the get go, uh, Grell made it very clear in writing in his development of the character. She is nobody's foe. She is very sharp. Uh, and he uses that height factor. There was the fact that she's tall for a woman uh, to, to uh, which it intimidates a lot of men. It does intimidate me. I'm five foot eight. You know, I've been short all my life, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and it never stopped me uh, in terms of relationships. It's never a factor for me. But uh, for, for some people, it is. And, and you know, that's, um, that's, that's an interesting take because it establishes a, it establishes a point of, of, of a sublime, intimidating authority, for lack of a better term. Uh, yeah, from point, you know? it is very interesting because it's clear right from this, this first it's, it's clear right from their first interaction that they're going to have this that there's there's something there and that it's going to be developed. But it's also yeah. clear that she is in control. She she has the power here because yeah. we have this guy who's like set up in the first issue to be he's basically like James Bond. He's this this powerful, manly, you know action guy and he's you know he's got lovers and and you know it, it's set up to be like he's going to be the james bond and there's a lot of major bond influences in later stories yeah. and then he undercuts it here by being like actually here's this woman that's not only taller than he is but she immediately sees everything about him and is kind of like I don't know if I want to be with this dude. And so she keeps him at arm length because she's kind of like, James Bond is kind of a dick. So I don't really want to get into that. You know, and the, the thing about that, that I really like about this character uh, about Mike Blackman as the artist is, is she's obviously much younger than him, but she reeks of self-confidence. And so it, she's not some fawning swooning female character that you would see in a lot of the romance comics you and I talk about. Uh, uh, she's, she, she knows who she is and she's confident in herself. Yeah. And it should be said that the other person in this sort of triangle, Eden is also very strong and confident yeah. knows and, and also to, and basically has the power in the relationship as well, because she's, um, she she knows exactly what the relationship is. She's getting mm -hmm. out of it what she wants. She's not jealous of anybody else. Um, and uh, you know, she's it's it's just very interesting. They're given the setup as oh, of him in this sort of James Bond role. There's two female characters that he has the closest relationship with that are nothing like the women that you see in the James Bond movies. Right. Uh, issues three, four, five, and six present this four issue origin story arc. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's not entirely cohesive as like one story. It's sort of like multiple stories that oh. tell his origin. It's also interesting that it, it starts with him already in his late twenties um, and basically, we get the story of how he met his wife at the 1972 Munich Olympics. Um, and again, I thought this was going to have some sort of special relevance because we, in the previous issue, we had uh, this Nazi ring. And then in this issue, the, you know, issue three, we get the thing where the Israeli um, athletes are. Uh, murdered by the terrorists mm -hmm. that actually ends up having no connection to anything um, so it's just I don't know I thought that Grell was going somewhere with that by setting it specific and very specifically sets of the 72 Munich games they even see the terrorists and don't act because they don't realize what's going on right I thought it interesting also that he had, they had you know he actually has an interaction with Mark Spitz who was the, you know, won seven gold medals, you know, at Munich. 
uh, but he's actually as an unnamed character in the book i think he actually calls him mark at some point but they never say the last name and it's very obviously mark spitz yeah uh, you know so yeah it was interesting that he said it that way uh but i guess uh you know given the character's background uh you know and and, and especially being the pentathlon um i mean timeline wise it would be about right because i believe they placed sable's birth to birth uh, around 1944 right so uh you know he's very young uh and and you know has not as we'll see you know it, other things in his life crucial points in his life and crucial crucial occupations in his life have not taken place yet um and you know so it's uh it was an interesting setting, you know, whether it was necessary or not, I don't know, other than, other than that's another point where Grill inserts an actual event into a fictional setting. Right. You know. It's also interesting, like, when I was a kid, it was right when the Marvel handbook, uh, you know, the, the handbook to the Marvel Universe is coming out, the DC who's who, and those would always say, like, in the skills, it would be like, Olympic level athlete. Yeah. So Growl's establishing here in a, in a fairly subtle way how Sable, why Sable is so good yeah. because he's an actual Olympian who specializes in the pentathlon. We're going to see a really, really goofy story much later on that's specifically about the pentathlon. Yeah. Uh, that's, we'll wait till we get there because that one was hilariously goofy. Um, he meets his wife and they fall in love and they, she uh, they go he follows her to africa and um then we have this whole section in africa where they set up this homestead they have children and then there's these poachers that are encroaching on the land and he sort of takes this job sort of to stop the poachers and they end up killing his whole family um which gives him this horrible backstory and the motivation and this death wish that you talked about earlier one thing that's interesting that is that this whole origin sequence of these four issues is taking place in a frame story where um, Mike has asked Eden about John Sable and Eden has this manuscript that he wrote about his life. And so this is all in the context of Mike reading a book about Sable's past right. that he had written. And I found that to be a really interesting device. I liked it a lot because obviously Mike's not part of his origin because we just met her in, in the last issue, but it keeps her in here. We get to see their relationship progressing and in a way when he's not even aware it's happening yeah. <laughs> because we see her feelings towards him change as she learns more about him. Right. And so I thought that was a really clever frame story. It also establishes a couple things in here. We learned that even though B.B. Flem, the children's author, is his, this fake alter ego that he thinks is really stupid and loads, and he's always making cracks about how this, the, he only does this to pay the bills. Right. Um, we find out that actually he was a writer before he was a mercenary, and that writing was was his it was his like first sort of love and then he sort of just fell into this mercenary life after his family was killed um so i thought that was interesting one way we that i found it interesting is that we sort of learn about the lies that sable is telling himself about himself how he's reframing things and we learn that just like everybody, we all have these ideas of who we are. Right. And we're not necessarily right. You know, other right. people can see things about us that we can't. And we see here that Sable, um, he's sort of, he's putting on a front for himself a lot of times and being this tough guy. Uh, and it was just really, is kind of interesting. Well, it's interesting you point that out, Scott, because I really think that in terms of this, these four issues, and in the context where it's done, the fact that it's it, he, he uses the manuscript and, and Mike reading the manuscript allows him to pace it over the four issues, concentrating on certain certain events in each issue. 
but it, you go back to, uh, you know, with Sable as a writer, very obviously he wrote this with the intent to publish it one day. And, you know, there's also hints that, you know, he wanted to write articles about hunting, game hunting and, 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 and wildlife preservation and, and firearms and all this other stuff. But, but he, you know, really didn't get no, no bites on, on what he was, you know, what he was writing. And so I think that this really, we go back to, to Grell, to the creator, and how I think he used this series as well as Green Arrow and Warlord as, as cathartic vehicles for his own, you know, you know, issues or things he wanted to work out and put on paper. And I think this is a really interesting parallel because it's exactly what Sable does in this manuscript. Yeah, and we're going to see the uh, in, in a interesting way Sable's relationship with his own writing and with himself as a writer and not as a mercenary. the The arc that he has there uh, is sort of. Um, shows the character arc like the more he becomes the writer the and the closer he gets to mike and the more he sort of lets himself feel things again and be himself again the more he gets into the writing and moves away from the mercenary work and so the the manuscript comes up again later on this desire to write these articles comes up again later on becomes plot point much later on in the series um so we're getting the origin here, but it actually is setting up again, a lot of the building blocks for all of the stuff we're going to see later on. There's a couple other interesting things that happen. So in issue four, we get a lot of stuff about poaching and there's this guy who, this nameless guy with the white hair who is ordering, who is like the, the guy in charge of the poachers. Yeah. And oh, so we think at this point, yeah. well, so we think, um, and at in the at the end of the origin story in issue six, it actually c- catches up the present day because Sable has gone back to Africa, even though he's. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here about the political history of parts of Africa, Zimbabwe and Rhodesia, Rhodesia, and again very tied to the time. Like, he's got the dates. This happens in seventy nine. This happens in eighty, and it's important because of the shifting politics that are taking place in the African countries. So he's very specifically tying it to specific moments in history. Mm-hmm. At the end of the story, even though Sable's been thrown out. Um, of the country he goes back and he tracks down this guy and he seems to get his final revenge um, but it turns out it's not quite final because this guy uh, there's someone else involved and oh, that doesn't come up again until much 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 later in the arc I've already referenced once the arc that for me it should have been the end of the series um, there's a lot of stuff going on again here. Grell, it's, it's really, it's very thematically complex. It's complex on a character level. It's complex structurally with the frame stories. Um, I thought it was really well done. Uh, it is interesting, as I mentioned already, the parts that he leaves out of the origin because by starting in 1972 and Sable's already 28 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, he ends up retiring from the Olympics after this because he's past his prime. Yeah. We're going to later on get a bunch of stuff that fills in those first 28 years. So he left himself space to do more stuff. Um, I, ha- I definitely have the impression that Grell uh, knew exactly where he was going with the character like he had worked out everything about this character absolutely and this was this was a well thought out character before the the first book was ever published and it's very obvious the further you get it because it's not just picking up i mean we're not talking about the elk with a gun you know in defenders i mean this is not some random character that just drops in here and there there are specific plot points that tie back in. It, it, you know, you talked about recently about the uh, the long running plot point in, in, in that he did in in uh, Warlord. Uh, you know, and it, it's it's similar to that. It, it, of course, timeline's not as large, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I think he knew exactly where he was going, and, and that's really the. Uh, I read a lot of historical fiction. Um, uh, probably a couple of my, 
my most favorite historical fiction authors, and you may or may not know them, is a guy by the name of uh, Bernard Cornwell. And then there's another, uh, uh, is uh, George MacDonald Fraser. And Fraser wrote the Flashman novels, and, and Bernard Cornwell wrote the, uh, the Sharp series of novels, along with several other uh, historical series. And they're both very, uh, they, you know, very adept at, at, at creating a fictional character inserting it into an actual historical timeline and and documenting that character's you know telling a story around that character's interaction in those actual timelines and i really think that that's grail had had a con similar concept when he created this character he knew where he was going with it uh and that really to me that's the mark of a great writer because you're not just writing you're not just doing sequential art you're not just doing a lot of uh, of, of one issue storylines You've got you can compartmentalize them into two, three, four issue you know arcs, but you still you still see the end of the road. Uh, just the, the reader can't see it yet, but you already have that 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 course plotted. Okay, that's it for this episode of the Classic Comics Forum podcast. As always, I'd like to thank my guest Tartan Phantom. And next time around, in two weeks, we'll be back with part two, where we discuss uh, John Sable Freelance issues seven to twenty seven, and we get into the real heart of the run. So uh, that's next time. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you then.